I'm Nicholas, uh, and I work at Twitter. I recently joined the WebCore team there. Uh, I work there with Brett, who helped organize this with Jonathan and Nicole. And uh, I kind of ended up with the opportunity to work at Twitter because I spent a lot of time working on open source software. And when I was working on open source stuff, I got to meet a lot of uh, really interesting people who taught me a lot about um, how to do web development, introduced me to other interesting people, and introduced me to all kinds of different projects that were going on. One thing that really struck me was the speed at which things were changing all the time. And pretty quickly I realized that the thing that was holding me back was not how quickly I could change the code that I was working on, but how quickly I could adapt my way of thinking to sort of accommodate all the other stuff that was going on. So when I first started to learn how to do web development, uh, which was like about five years ago, uh, CSS was kind of the easy part to, to work with. You, initially, once you learn the syntax and you learn uh, how to make a, you know, a button look red or whatever, um, you think that you kind of know most of what there is. You know, it's like, this is pretty easy to work with. But four years later, by the time I joined Twitter, or was about to join Twitter, uh, I'd already learned that working on CSS for large teams and large web applications was a pretty painful process. And since I've joined Twitter, and I've had the chance to write more JavaScript and learn more about the JavaScript world, and work on two large CSS code bases, one for TweetDeck, which I helped rewrite, and the other one, which is Twitter.com, I realized that uh, working with CSS in some ways is probably uh, like one of the worst parts of being a web developer. It's really difficult um, to work with because you have to kind of maintain an, an awareness of how the whole thing is put together in your mind, whereas at least with JavaScript, there are ways to kind of work in small encapsulated spaces. And so, that's kind of be, going to kind of be like the backing, like the background to uh, what I'm going to talk about, which is kind of some reflections on um, like what I experienced when I was learning web development and how a lot of the things that people were teaching me and best practices that I should follow um, often came with this other ideology that I kind of didn't realize at the time, which was that this uh, searching for absolute truths and looking for the one true way to do things and the purging of other people's ideas that didn't really match with uh, what was considered a best practice. And so as we're heading into this time where the web platform is changing very rapidly, um, and it's going to change a lot for CSS developers as well, it's kind of interesting to look back, um, and this is something that I have learned to do, to look back at how things changed in the past and how we responded to that change to see if we can try and avoid some of the mistakes that we made before. So before I was a developer, um, I studied uh, natural sciences at university and switched to anthropology after a friend of mine introduced me to it there. And it was one of those things um, that you know, everyone has some moments in life where they say, this changed my life. And studying anthropology was one of those for me and has been so far. And what I really liked about it is it has this heavy uh, focus on looking for assumptions. And to do that, you kind of have to look through the history of ideas. And one of those, it's one of those things where you're not even necessarily aware of what your assumptions are until you start exploring some of the assumptions that you are aware of. And you see this whole world of uh, of ways of thinking that were created a long, long time ago and that we've kind of just adopted as just given, uh, just a given as part of our lives. And when you do go look at the history of these ideas, as they kind of force you to when you're an anthropology student, um, you get to see what else was around at the time, some of the kind of debates that were going on. So maybe there was an idea that came about that now we just take for granted. But at the time, it was controversial and it's kind of fun to see that you know, there were times where even the smartest of people weren't entirely convinced by things that now everyone just assumes is the truth. And when you're doing that, you see this sort of pattern where ideas go through these cycles where they get iterated upon. And something that didn't really work in its time, later, perhaps, it sort of makes more sense in the context that it kind of reappears. This kind of like cycle of renaissance and decline. And uh, one of these examples, which is the one that I'm going to use as the kind of... Uh, example, like the showcase, I suppose, for, for this, as I kind of talk through like HTML and CSS, is uh, when they sent us back into pre-Socratic Greece to try and understand where a lot of the ideas from the West came from. And so this guy, Heraclitus, who I came across, who I don't really remember a huge amount of the stuff that I studied about ancient Greece, but I remember this guy because one of the things that he said really stuck with me. And uh, 
He was depicted like this by Renaissance painters, and it was really the Renaissance that rediscovered a lot of the ideas that he and a few of the other people that I'll talk about um, came up with. And he had contempt for humankind. He was portrayed as the weeping, the lonely philosopher. And he read a lot of really obscure philosophy, most of which was lost to time, but what's left is kind of reads almost more like poetry than philosophy. You kind of have to sit back and think, like, what, was he, what was he trying to say here? Um, but his, his main thing was this uh, like championing of the idea of an ever-changing world. One of his peers, someone called Parmenides, had the opposite view, which was that the world was static and that change was this surface layer, this illusion. And that was the context uh, within which Democritus found himself. He was a contemporary of Socrates, and he was attempting to reconcile this idea of an ever-changing world and a static world. Like, how can these two ideas like, live together, or how can I decide you know, which one to, to kind of support? Uh, this is how he was portrayed, and he's always portrayed like, he kind of looks a bit evil. Like, I, keep, I kept trying to find better pictures of him, and he's always got like a beret <laughs> and like a, sh a shoulder out. Um, so this will have to do. And like Heraclitus, he also had contempt on some level for mankind. Um, and he was known as the laughing or mocking philosopher, like a good likeness. And from today's perspective, he had some really modern ideas. So he spoke about the conservation of mass and energy, uh, the indirect nature of perception. But his main, uh, the main thing that he's remembered for is the atomic conception of the universe. He came up with a very early uh, idea of how atoms worked, basically, along with his, with his mentor. And he used atoms as a way to try and reconcile these two ideas, the static and the changing world. And he said, OK, so the world is completely changing. Like, I can buy into that. But when you reduce the world, what is its constituent parts? And its constituent parts are all these different types of atoms. And these atoms are like billiard balls. They're like static, unchanging. And so this is how he reconciled it. It was like, it's both static and unchanging. Unfortunately for him, uh, Plato and Aristotle didn't like him. They criticized his work and him as a person. And this static idea, this idea of a static universe that Parmenides suggested was the one that became dominant and stuck around for about 2,000 years until it was challenged during the Renaissance and again later with modern science. And this is the quote that I remember from Heraclitus, which is that you cannot step into the same river twice for fresh waters are flowing in upon you. And so I'm reading this and I've been sent back, you know, in time in effect by my lecturers to read about these guys. And I've come across someone from two and a half thousand years ago, and he's kind of giving me this license to constantly revisit all the things that I hold dear, and all the things that I assume to be true, which is, that was the whole point of what the, my lecturers were trying to teach me. And this, what he's really saying is like, if I come up to this metaphorical river and I think it's the same, that's, it's not that it's an illusion necessarily, but that's kind of like an artifact of my way of thinking. I'm not really looking at the world, I've just sort of turned up and been like, oh yeah, I've been at this river before, it's the same. But the river's different, I'm different, and the rest of the world is different, so it can't really be the same. When you think about like what we do, or like what I do now, when I like, write code instead of read this stuff, um, we're part of like this tech industry, and things are changing all the time very rapidly. And so it's very interesting to me to see how we kind of have these assumptions in this field, and kind of understanding that if our context is changing, what are the things that we hold dear and that we assume to be true that maybe aren't? So I'm going to skim over some of the history of HTML and CSS and provide my interpretation of that stuff. So HTML used to look um, a bit like this, and you had like, tables, and all the styling was handled with these attributes that you'd use to control positioning and other things like uh, font. And you had like on, well, you were lucky if you had uh, inline click handlers like this. And the cost of this was that as HTML became more complicated and added all these style capabilities to meet the needs of what people wanted to do with the web, um, it became harder and harder to maintain. You'd end up with like huge piles of DOM with, um, if you wanted to change the look of every single table cell, you'd have to like find and replace in all, the, all, all of your templates. If you wanted to add some styles, you'd have to go and do that through every single part of uh, your HTML. On top of that, browsers had a lot of difficulty uh, consistently rendering this, so you'd get different browsers looking different ways, uh, but all you had was a single interface from which you could try and control that. And users, especially people of assi with assistive technologies, couldn't kind of customize the website to look uh, and work in the way that they needed it to. And around this time, in 1994, uh, the W3C was formed, and people started working on style specifications, which eventually like, all coalesced into a single specification called CSS that became a specification uh, recommendation in 1996. And if you look through that document, there's a few interesting snippets in there that kind of give you an insight into the way that people were thinking at the time um, and some of their concerns as well. 
And there's this line here, like to increase the granularity of control over elements, a new attribute has been added to HTML class. So the class attribute was added for the purposes of CSS, so you could apply your styles um, through this interface rather than like bundling them all into the, uh, on the actual DOM itself. And throughout the early parts of the document, uh, of the specification, you can, you can see that there's a concern um, with what this, could, what this could bring about. And they tell you not to rely on this power, that they're afraid that this would affect the universal semantics of HTML. Because I, in effect, I could just mark everything up with, let's say, a div, and then control the entire presentation with CSS. Whereas at least in the past, I relied on some of the HTML to provide me with that. So that was this kind of recurring theme that they had. And uh, the CSS Zen Garden, which came about, started in 2003, was kind of meant to be a way of showing people like, the right way to do things, which was to have semantic HTML and all this powerful CSS. And it was, a, it was kind of an example of how you could, like an extreme example, I'd say, of have like, a single page of unchanging HTML, this very like, that, that idea of you know, that HTML is forever, you don't change that. And you just switch out style sheets and have like, radically different looks. So it was really there to promote the use of semantic markup and to sort of drag people away from this table world. But out of this approach and the reaction against the pre-CSS authoring days came a bunch of these things that we kind of parrot back to each other. This is one of my favorite ones, don't use unsemantic class names, whatever they think unsemantic means. And this is kind of, this is this great quote from a guy that um, really helped me learn a lot about web development when I was getting started, uh, called Croc Kamen, it's like his pseudonym. And he said, your HTML like diamond should be forever. And I really bought into this, this kind of perspective, like HTML is this thing, it's fixed, it's unchanging, you just want to write it once, and then all of the control of the presentation you just do somewhere else in your CSS. And that's really what I kind of thought, and I applied this thinking to my blog, and I wrote one of the early phases, one of the early passes at my blog, with like no classes at all, it was just like pure descendant selectors, this huge pile of CSS that controlled it all. And when I spent every day just me working on that code, that was okay. But when I took a break, did some like real work, and then came back and tried to change my blog, it was like really horrible to work with, very difficult. And at that point, I started to realize that despite the fact that I'd been like very, uh, I'd, I'd probably say militant about this kind of approach, thinking, you know, ah, oh, my blog is like the, an example of, of perfection, the way you should be writing HTML, I decided this actually wasn't the way I wanted to work, and that it was very hard for me to, you know, made my life difficult, basically. And so your dim diamonds might be forever, but your HTML probably isn't. But this kind of thinking is like so ingrained and so much as part of like the general discourse that it's even made its way into the HTML5 spec, where they're kind of like encouraging us to use, to write class names that reflect the content of the HTML rather than any presentational aspects. And alternative approaches have been like repeatedly purged as the mark of amateurs, which kind of makes it very hard for you to suggest um, not doing it this way. Like even now, when I talk sort of at Twitter and I say, well, maybe we should just use like an extra like div, like an empty div in the corner here instead of all this crazy CSS, I kind of feel like I sl slightly have to apologize for making that suggestion because I know that other people are looking at me thinking what I used to think about people who said things like this. But if you go back into the CSS spec, there's this other like chunk here, the sentence, which is like a structure based on class is only useful within a restricted domain where the meaning of a class has been mutually agreed upon. And I interpreted this as, like a, as a warning, like don't give up the universal semantics of HTML, this thing that we can sort of pass around and everyone can have this common language for a domain specific language that you're gonna, you know, you and your friends who are working on this website have agreed upon. But I think it contains the seed of an idea that we abandoned um, as we were kind of like taking on this more dogmatic approach to how you write HTML. And that's that we can use a domain specific, uh, we can use domain specific meaning if we need to. And it's particularly useful when we want to uh, reflect the structure of our presentation in a way that is separate from the content. Because semantics aren't just for HTML, semantics is just meaning. So we can have like presentational semantics as well, I think. So I hope I've showed that like class names were created for us and not for machines, that the content layer semantics are already dealt with by HTML and that but basically class names impart no real semantic meaning to machines at all, apart from their kind of co-option with microformats. Um, and so the purpose of a class is really for us to have like a hook so that we can feed CSS and JavaScript, like attach CSS and JavaScript to. And when you start writing your code a bit like this, where you just think, well, I'm gonna use the class to basically codify a pattern, and I'm just gonna basically imagine this design is just gray boxes. I'm not going to think, oh, this is a tweet. Then you can end up with 
these modules, these little chunks of CSS and HTML that are really reusable because they kind of they don't really care what's inside them. They just provide you this structure. And so it doesn't really matter which application you're working in or which part of the application you're working in. You don't have to constantly rebuild that. So ugly class names are things that don't look like this. At the moment, kind of we there's a tendency to use hyphens as just word separators, basically. We don't really do anything with the class other than sort of dream it up and think, well, this is a, this is a, a class that's appropriate for what I'm trying to do. And you end up with CSS that maps to that, which is a bit like this, where you have your generic components, some kind of modifiers. Sometimes you might end up with it as a chaining class. And this is fine when you're working on a small scale. But as soon as you start working on a larger scale, you have like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of components. And you have dozens of developers varying levels of expertise and experience, then it can be quite hard to, uh, to understand when you're reading a piece of DOM, like which parts of the DOM like, basically have style control over others. So this button group here, that's kind of reaching into an item, which is just purely a descendant. So at some point, I just have to make an implicit association between item and button group. And there's no guarantee that maybe that button group isn't within another component that also reaches into a descendant called item but does something different. Or if I have button, primary, and item all mixed in on the same DOM node. So when I read the CSS, I'm like, oh, of course, button and primary associated. But if I have button, primary, and item, you know, I have to kind of make this mapping in my mind constantly between the CSS that I've got and the DOM that I have and kind of try and keep the kind of association between the two like tightly coupled in my head. And this approach I found not to be very optimal. Whereas something like this, which uh, if you saw the top coat uh, talk, they kind of talked about this sort of type of naming convention, which um, I adapted from Yandex's web architecture. Like Yandex is this big uh, company that they build like search engines or something in Russia, and they have a lot of developers and a lot of websites. And this is the like the um, the latest notation that I've been using, which I stole from uh, Montage.js, which is another framework. And they kind of like riffed with the notation that I wrote about and came up with this one, which I think is a bit more readable. What it ends up doing is well, first of all, it flattens the, your selectors, so everything has the same specificity. So you can kind of avoid some of the more complex aspects of working with the cascade. Then it takes uh, every class and tries to make an explicit association between uh, the component that owns it, in effect, and then the, the kind of other aspects of that component. So a double hyphen, in this case, is used to indicate a modifier. So when I read that class, it's telling me I am modifying the button component. And wherever I see button group dash item, that's indicating a descendant uh, relationship, and it's telling me I'm a descendant of button group. So I know that exactly what's controlling it, and I can try and avoid, uh, if necessary, uh, mixing uh, components on the same DOM node if it kind of helps me to avoid like things that I'm trying to, like, to try and preserve the integrity of my UI in effect. You end up with HTML that looks a bit like this. Um, we have button group, button group item, like that is the main sort of structure of this one component, and then inside it can be well, anything, but I mean, in this case, it's pretty clearly designed to have a button inside it. But the button component doesn't really know anything of the button group component, which is kind of how you want it. You want to be able to write these things in isolation as much as possible to try and chew off small parts of the problem rather than deal with like the whole UI all at once. And as Ryan said earlier, uh, I ripped this from earlier today, he says, like, if you haven't tried, if you think it's verbose, then you might not have tried it. And so this kind of running theme that I've got of try these things out, don't necessarily don't dismiss them immediately because it's unfamiliar to you. Give it a try. And like my first reaction was like, oh, God, no. But then you try it and you're like, oh, yeah, this helps like, solve some of the problems that I'm experiencing and makes my life a bit easier. And the nice thing about working like this, I found, is that I can build these things as standalone components. So I just have a GitHub repo with the CSS and a test file to sort of test for regressions when I change the code in there. And that's it. It's basically two files, and the rest is just like cruft for for GitHub. And it's just a, so I've had that packed up into a reusable component, which is like a Bower package, which is a package manager. And then I can include it like this. So I have, uh, so suit is like the, this kind of, I don't know, toolkit thing that I'm working on that I use to try and store all these components that help me with my dev work. And all it is is basically a file that just says these are the dependencies that I have. And it just pulls in all these other components that I have. And the suit utils itself is another like six or seven packages. So I kind of just build up this tree of packages. Um, and I can use them piecemeal, like one at a time if I want. And I kind of just use this all the time now. I haven't written CSS for a button for 
about a year since I wrote the original suit button. I kind of just tweak it when I need to, but whenever I need a button, I just import this, and it gives me the structural uh, foundations for a button, and then I can add some style and stuff later, like theming style, that is, later. So in the context of the current development environment, this is quite useful because it helps me to communicate presentational structure between the rest of the team, and it can kind of happen independently of your semantic HTML. So you can still keep all of the you know, articles and lists and all that that you need, but then you just kind of move the styling layer into its own, into its own semantic layer where you don't really rely on a specific DOM. You just want to kind of have these chunks that simply give you a presentation no matter what the DOM is underneath it. So this ties into uh, a related commandment, which is that we shouldn't be using extra elements. And this was something I really believed and I really helped to champion the use of pseudo elements for visual detail over extra elements. Um, but I really don't like working like this anymore. There's kind of like too much magic going on. And at best with a pseudo ele element, you get one extra element. Um, and a lot of the time you want to do something a bit more interesting. So this is how I might write some code now, uh, where I have like this generic box component. And then all I know is that box has an optional item in it, which is going to be a close button, which is I'm going to use the box close to like position the, the close button up in the corner. And then everything in there, it doesn't know about it at all. So I have button, which um, you know, I keep the semantics of like a button element, but then I throw some other stuff on there. So I'm like, oh, I want to reset that button to just look like a piece of text, because I don't want all the border and the padding and everything that comes with it. And then I'm going to add some uh, JavaScript into that, but I don't want to couple the JavaScript to my presentation, because you know, maybe I'll change that text-like class later. And then inside there, I have a standalone component, which is an icon, which again knows nothing about everything that's going on outside of it. And you can tell that I have like a modified version of an icon, which is a close icon, and that might have an icon font or something in there. And then a help class to like, basically pull this text off screen. So I just end up with, like, for example, a, a cross in the corner. But screen readers will still be able to sort of know that it's a close button. So this is kind of quite easy to read once you get used to it. It's kind of easy to build up. Uh, like this piece of UI without having to write any extra CSS, which is something I really try and avoid to do these, doing these days because, like I said, I kind of don't really like CSS at the moment. Um, but it's a bit clunky and messy. Fortunately, it's not 1996 anymore, and we've got templating engines. So I can just like hide the implementation details in a partial. And if I use uh, template inheritance, then I can also specify a part of this component where something else can live. So what I end up with is somewhere else in my UI, uh, somewhere else in my application, I have um, a specific part of the UI that just says, I'm going to inherit this shared component, which is like a box with a close button. And then every other part of the UI that wants to use a box with a close button can just inherit this shared template. I don't have to keep writing the same class all over my code, making it hard to kind of modify this piece of the UI when I want to make a change. So this is also kind of nice, but we're working with strings and not DOM, uh, which is unfortunate. There are frameworks that sidestep this, like AngularJS, which is this kind of really forward-thinking framework that's trying to look at how the web might be and give you, um, like, kind of remove a lot of the boilerplate, like this stuff, which relies on like a client-side templating engine or a, or a server-side templating engine, a bunch of conventions, uh, this kind of custom syntax, which means that when I make a component, I can't just kind of give you a way to use it because we're not really just working with CSS working with HTML and CSS. So I go, here's the CSS. Like, good luck. Go and write the HTML yourself, and you know, I hope it works out. Um, and so the real problem is that we don't have any encapsulation with CSS. So I can't just create a piece of HTML, some styles, and give it to you, because you have to basically buy into the full like, architectural principle that I've laid out in order to avoid having styles cross these component boundaries which means it's very hard to have confidence when you're working in an application that when you drop something in or when you create something for the first time that it's not going to be affected when someone goes and works on a seemingly unrelated part of the UI and ends up blowing up uh, your website. And you know, unfortunately, these are desperate measures that we have to take, all this kind of like ridiculous, I mean, it, it kind of feels ridiculous once you get down this, uh, once you start building it out on like, the level that you do with large web applications where you have dozens and dozens and dozens of these uh, templates and blobs of CSS, and then one day someone's like, yo, we're redesigning the website, and you have to start again from scratch or something like that. And it's kind of, it's very difficult. And so protecting against different DOM permutations and all of that is very difficult, even for experienced developers. And most of us um, maybe have some like, familiarity with it, but you know, it's kind of bizarre that some of us have built entire careers around like that stuff, 
which is basically nothing more than trying to defend against all of the flaws um, that we experience working with CSS and HTML. But fortunately, web components are coming along and they're going to make like, my entire skill set obsolete. Because um, what they're going to do is push a lot of this into the native web platform and restore some of my sanity. And they're going to add a bunch of powerful features, including encapsulation. And when you start looking through your web components and the specifications for them, it kind of really highlights the fact that it's, you know, we can't just continue to work the way that we did back in, you know, as, as a uh, reaction against the pre-CSS days, because things are going to change like, radically. And so all those mistakes that we've been making, well, not mistakes, but the strong reaction against uh, the pre-CSS authoring days that led to these dogmatic approaches that were difficult to work with and that we've spent the last five or more years trying to extract ourselves from. We're going to go through another period of that coming up with web components. And some of it's going to make our lives much easier, but I'm sure there's going to be plenty of things that we'll do that will throw away a lot of the stuff that we're doing now, where perhaps some of those ideas deserve to live on, and we should maybe be a little bit careful with that. So the promise of web components is that they're going to help us make these like, visually rich UIs that we're basically not capable of doing at the moment. And the way that they hope to do that is by basically relying on more markup. What? Um, <laughs> but, the, but inside all of that is this promise of encapsulation, interoperability, and reuse, which are the main problems. You know, like almost everything we've been hearing today, um, well, I mean, obviously, apart from the performance stuff and that, is based around like attempts to try and solve these problems, attempts to provide a way, sorry, didn't mean to diss you, I meant, I meant in a good way. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's an attempt to, to sidestep this problem, an attempt to pretend that we don't have to kind of be aware of how an entire application is put together in order to work with CSS and DOM. And so what Web Components are going to provide us with is native templating, so we don't have to rely on uh, kind of your uh, client-side templating or server-side templating language of choice. Uh, library of choice, encapsulation for CSS and JavaScript, custom elements so we can kind of define our own bits of the UI, and HTML imports to help kind of make all this shareable. And the three key parts of that, uh, the shadow DOM, which is the bit that's going to give us encapsulation and kind of provide these DOM boundaries, which is, when I said that CSS sucks, it's, it kind of does, but it's because we can't basically contain it within a certain chunk of DOM. So it's kind of a, it's the two together that's the problem. Uh, element, which is how we're going to define custom elements and extend native elements and template, which is going to be the part that gives you like, these inert parts of DOM. So you can just work directly with DOM. You don't have to have strings or work with DOM, but try and like, hide it somewhere in a script tag and then hope that it doesn't slow the parsing down. And so the way that that close button might be implemented in this contrived example is like this. So I have extend, I have element, and which I'm telling is extending the native button element. And then this template, which is going to be the part that like, stamps out uh, DOM and styles and stuff for me whenever I need to, whenever I call on it to be used. And I can sort of control the appearance of the, of the template by uh, sort of attaching this, I think this is correct at the moment, like at host, so I tell me, like, the button that I am, like, make me not look like a button, do some other stuff, and then there's, like, another custom element in there, icon, which I use, um, which is just another, basically one of these, but, like, encapsulated and hidden somewhere else. And this is going to help kind of push these implementation details somewhere else again in the same way that we use the partial, but provide us with much nicer interface. And you can see we're kind of back to, you know, what it was like when you first started, which is you just have a small chunk of CSS, a knowable DOM, and a small chunk of JavaScript. And there's a single file, and everything that you need to know about that, uh, this element, is in one file. I'm, I can control the level of styles that flow in and out of this element, and I can have confidence that when I write some code here, that it's going to be protected, which means that I can suddenly take it and give it to someone else. And because it's part of the web platform as well, it means that anyone who will be working like this, we can all write our own widgets and share them around. At least that's the, that's the hope. And the Google Chrome guys have had this really nice term for this, which is like a declarative renaissance, like a return to relying on like attributes and piping data in like that, uh, using markup because it's OK. This is going to be hidden in a shadow DOM that will never be seen at the next layer of my application when I make use of this custom element like this. But like I said, it's like a renaissance for CSS, because we can go back to trusting it, and almost anyone could work with CSS. That problem of uh, the well-meaning developer and uh, like the back-end team who has to put a quick patch in, or who has to implement some new feature, who accidentally blows up part of the site, um, or you know, having to rely on visual diffing tools for your entire website in order to be confident that you haven't destroyed some distant part of it, that is hopefully going to go away. And you know, obviously, this is DOM, so all oh, that's much nicer. 
But this isn't entirely new because, as I showed, we're trying to do something like this at the moment with the tools that we've kind of built for ourselves. But the, develop, uh, the browser vendors have also been doing this. So if you bust out Chrome Canary and then go into the DevTools and turn on Show Shadow DOM, then you can ins inspect some elements. Uh, so if you look at the video element or some of these input elements, like the date element, then you can see the, their implementation of it behind the scenes. And this document fragment is basically saying, I'm Shadow DOM, and that's the part that we never see. But this is exposing it, and you can see it's just basically a bunch of divs, some uh, accessibility helpers, some ways of exposing parts of the Shadow DOM to be styled outside of the Shadow DOM, but only if you specifically ask for it. Like, if I just said div red, it's not going to affect any of this. So they have this encapsulation, and they're basically going to be giving it to, it, give, giving it to us. And hopefully that's going to make our lives much easier. So it's OK to use extra elements. We have been for a while, and we probably will be for the foreseeable future. But we're coming full circle. So now we have CSS and JavaScript in our HTML templates again. They're not, we're not, we probably aren't going to have huge style sheets with all of the style you know, somewhere else, all the JavaScript somewhere else, and then a big directory full of templates. It's going to be these small components. We're basically going to take a web app and scale that down so that everything is like a small element in effect. And our web apps will just be a collection of elements where at each layer we're kind of hiding some of the implementation details that we don't need to know about at the layer that we're working in. And this is going to completely change our jobs, which means that we have to be prepared to do, as Heraclitus said, and to step back into the river. So we have to challenge the assumptions that we're kind of taking with us now, because they're definitely going to change. Uh, some of the assumptions that we'll sort of develop as we're working with this are also going to be things that we should sort of have a second think about before kind of bashing other people over the head with them, and making the same mistakes that we did uh, last time around, which is, you know, someone comes along, tries something out, we lambast them for not doing it in the way that we have decided is the way to be. So be open to the way, be open to suggestions from others and the way that other people like to do things. Uh, be prepared to be wrong, I guess, um, and to not just imitate others, but to have a think for yourself about you know, what is it, what is the context that I'm working in now? You know, is the, is the problem they're trying to solve the same as I'm trying to solve? And be prepared to have all of your projects uh, and ideas washed away, like with time. Like most of the stuff I've worked on is not going to be relevant uh, in the next few years. And like, I'm okay with that because, you know, there's no point clinging on to things that were designed to work in a different era. And I think that's the main way to avoid basically stagnating, to enjoy working with other people and to have any hope of doing something original. That's it.